Hello, welcome to Daily Dose of Rust Language. So yesterday we took a look at how to use generic types for functions. Okay, and today we are going to look at how to use generic types on structs. Now, as we've treated structs before, you can watch this video to see how structs work in Rust that are similar to classes. So let's say we want to create a struct that we'll call point, which will signify a point in a 2D space. You will have an X value. Okay, and then you have, let's say it will be of type I32, and then a Y value. Okay, now, if we want to use this struct, we can create a point. Now we have an instance of this point. We've passed three for X value, and then five for Y value. Now, the problem with doing this this way is that we are only limited to I32 values. We cannot use floating point values. We cannot use any other values, even I64, something like that. For example, if you try to use a floating point value here, it's not going to work because that will cause an error. You see, Rust Analyzer will start warning us. And then you see the error, mismatched type, expected I32 but find floating point number. Now, luckily for us, Rust has this feature called generic types. We can make this class accept whatever type we want. So instead of hard coding I32, we can use a generic type by using this angle brackets and providing a custom type that we are defining for ourselves. And then we can now say each of these will have this type. So what this will give us the ability to do is be able to call, get an instance of this struct with any value at all. You can see that, that that error is gone now. You can use integer types, you can use floating point types and other types as well. So this is the purpose of generic types in Rust. Now to take it a little bit further. So how about methods? How do we use the generic types in method? Okay, let's say we have a method here for this, for this struct. And then you provide the method. So function print x. And then we make it a method by providing this. So we've covered this before in the video we made for structs, how you can create methods for structs. So check out that video. You'll see it in the description. Okay, let's say we're also returning the type t in this case. And then all we have to do here is to print this to the terminal. Let's say x is equal to that. And then we provide x. We use self.x. Let's say we also return this as reference. Then we can now return it x. Okay, so we are good. Now the first problem you will start noticing is that if you hover over this, it will say cannot find type t in this scope. So what it simply means is that even when you provided the generics when you are defining the struct, right here, when in the implementation blocks, when you are defining your methods, you must provide that type again, t over here. So this will make it available for use inside this implementation block. Now, this is for what you destruct, the signature of the struct, while this is where the, you define the generics that you're going to use inside here. Now we are calling it t, you can call it whatever you want, but we'll still take a look at that. Now the next problem you start noticing is this. If you hover over this, you see this error. T doesn't implement the standard format display. And what it means is this, even though Rust will allow you to use these custom types as generics, Rust doesn't really know exactly what they are. Okay. And right now we are trying to print it to the terminal and Rust needs to make sure that whatever we are printing here follows this format. And in this case, it was not able to determine what T really is. What we can do here, there are two ways you can approach this issue, okay, to make sure that it implements this display format. First, we can use this format instead. And once we do that, you see that display format error is gone. And now we are getting another error. Yeah, it says T doesn't implement the bug. And that is true because this format requires whatever we are printing to implement the debug thread. Remember the debug thread is like an interface. Okay, so what we can do here is to make sure that we let Rust know that this generic type T will implement the debug thread so that this macro is going to accept it. 
So there are two ways we can do that. First, we can come in here and then say, use the where keyword. Here we say where t implements the debug threat. Okay. But we have to imp import it import it here by using the use keyword. So importing it here by using the use keyword will allow us to define that this t, which is a generic type here, is going to implement this debug threat. And that will allow us to use it here. Another way of doing it is let's just copy this one. And let's just comment this one out. Another thing you can do in case if this we are keyword is a little bit confusing is to come over here where you've defined this generics type and then you provide the threats it implements. So we are now defining a thread bound to this T to show that this T must implement this thread called the bug. And that also works. So this might be an easier way of doing it. It's either you do it this way or you use the where keyword. So now that we have that, we can easily come in here and print this to the terminal. Okay, we can easily come in here and then call point one dot print x. We can also do that with point two. And then if we run the code, we get the first one x is equal to three and x is equal to three point zero. So this way we are able to use generics to allow a struct to accept any type we want. Now, as we pointed out in the previous video, you don't need to provide this type like you do in Java or maybe in TypeScript. Here you have to provide the type for a generics when you are creating an instance of the class. In here, Rust will infer that for this first instance, that the type for the generics will be an integer, but for this one, it's going to be a floating type value. Now, another question you might have is, should we use this, should we use the same name for the generics that we used here? And the answer is not really. For example, we can call it R or something else, but once you start providing it, so once you change it here, you have to go inside the implementation block and change all, all of them as well. So we can come in here and then change this to R and that will be fine. And I'm going to show you why. If you run that code now, you see it still works. Okay. Now in case you're wondering how we are able to use different names for these generic types. Okay. And the idea is this. This, for, this struct called point is generic over this type T, right? T right here is just like a placeholder. It doesn't say anything because there is no type defined anywhere here that is named T. So it's just like a placeholder. Therefore, if you come in here and then you rename that placeholder, it doesn't mean much. Rust will still be able to work with this name. Okay. All it needed is a name right here for this type, for this generics and it will be fine and it will use it all over here. Now remember that for example, if we compile this code, what Rust does, and this is also important to know, because you might be wondering if this will affect performance, okay? What Rust does when you compile this code is that Rust will detect that you used this struct with generic types for integer and also for a floating point value. So what it will do is it will, claim, it will automatically create two implementations for a floating point type and then for an integer type so that when the code starts running and they are being called they'll be called separately that way the speed of execution will still be the same thing so it doesn't matter these are just for placeholder until the code is until rust starts compiling the code now you can also provide more than one generics you can provide as many as you want for example you can provide another one that will call you and then say that y will be of type here okay so this will allow us to provide different types for u for x and then for y and remember that there are also placeholders so what this will allow you to do is this one can be integer this one can be float both of them can be float at the same time for example this will allow us to come in here 
to Y and then say Y will now be float. And Ross is not going to panic. There won't be any problem. However, if we as as it was before, if we remove this, Ross to start underlining this because it can't work with two types. We have to allow it to work with two types in order to be able to provide two types here. So if we provide you and then use it somewhere here, Rust will allow this. Okay, because any of them could be any of these two types. Now, another question you might have is this. What if there is need for R to implement more than one thread, right? So for example, if we change this format to one what we had before, okay, Rust will start pointing out that it cannot work with this format that R doesn't implement the standard display format. Now, this is a thread as well. So Ross needs to make sure that X, which is in this case, will be of type R, must implement that display type. Now, what we can do here is to provide the display thread right here. So you use this plus sign to indicate that this type R, when used, must implement both the debug thread and also the display thread. And now that error is gone. And you will be now able to use this format. Now you can also provi provide more than one if you want. Okay, depends on what you want to do. Now if you are using this we are clause right here to specify the threads as well. Yeah, you can do the same thing. All you have to do is also use the plus sign here okay and then say it will implement display the display thread as well but also of course you know that you have to update this as well okay okay so that's it guys make sure you subscribe and like the video and in the next video we are going to look at threads and how to implement them like some of our viewers have requested so make sure you're subscribed so that you get notified when i release that video thanks